Chris Lee and Blake Lovell of Southeastern 14 here to wrap up Tuesday SEC basketball games, January 31st. We'll go approximately in order that they tipped off. For full disclosure, we had an appliance delivery the house last night, so that got in my way of a lot of basketball watching, but I know who's got us covered. That's Blake Lovell. Let's start Mississippi State, South Carolina. That was in Columbia. I saw a little bit of it. Kakil Moore was pretty good. And as we had noted, this was the the much more winnable portion of state schedule. And it, it certainly checked off a box that it had to check off last night with the win over South Carolina. If state is going to get that uphill battle to get to the NCAA tournament. Yeah, this was a game that I thought early, you know, South Carolina, this was a good game, but I guess it half what was it i think mississippi state was up five or six at half maybe something like that and you know south carolina was kind of hanging around and i i think i said in the preview i'm like look i mississippi state to me is the kind of team that i feel like would struggle to just pull away from teams because of their their offensive issues right um so like i think you look at it that way and I was like, all right, maybe they're going to hang around a little bit. But then eventually, you know, it's just like we say with South Carolina, right? It just kind of catches up with you. And I think that's just the story for South Carolina this season. And it's just, you know, they can play well for stretches, but it just eventually catches up with them that they just don't have, you know, that that extra gear, the the depth it's the, that every other team in the SEC has. And, and again, that's in context comparing them to the the top teams versus the bottom teams. But, I mean, that's just one of those things where, again, you, you know, you, you start to think, well, maybe South Carolina, this is the kind of team Mississippi State struggles offensively, can find a way, right? And, and we said they're going to need a just a, an outstanding shooter performance to beat anybody this season. They're going to have to hit 12 plus threes. I go 8 to 24. You know, they didn't really hit a lot of shots um, elsewhere. Just, I mean, it's the same stuff. Like, again, there's no reason to go too far into it. This was not a great game from an offensive standpoint. But we kind of expected that. Uh, this this really did sort of play out probably as you would have thought it would. And for Mississippi State, you know, is it a great win? Yes, because it's not a loss. And that's all that matters at this point for Mississippi State. Because so you, you have to qualify. Right? Yeah, that's what I say, because you have to qualify it as a, as a great win because, you know, you didn't lose. And it's not a great win for your resume, but it's a great win because you didn't get the worst loss you could have on your schedule. So, um yeah, in that instance, uh, it, it's one they had to have. And like you said, the schedule starts to, I don't want to say get easier because now they got Missouri next, but it's more manageable in how the schedule plays out from here here versus how it was, you know, that first month of SEC play. So nice win for Mississippi State. I know it's not one that's going to do anything for their resume, but uh, it is one that I think you start to realize, okay, there is – kind of light at the end of the tunnel based on what we just went through the past month. Now we start to have a schedule that feels a lot more manageable and it kind of started with this one. Yeah. Just from a box score perspective, I mean, it was sort of the typical state game in in some ways. What was it? 16 turnovers to 18 assists, three, 12 from three, but what were they? Um, 24 of 39 from two, which that's probably what state's going to have to do to, to win games is shoot well on <laughs> short range shots. And, you know, I, I know Carolina's not a good offensive team, but holding them to 51 is – you hold anyone to 51, you, you've done a pretty nice job. Okay. Uh, any more on that before we move on to a and and Arkansas? No, I have nothing else. Well, we went with the home team in that one. It ended up being the right call. Did you see the dunk that Ricky Council had towards the end of that game? Yeah, it was pretty good. Pretty good. That might have been the dunk of the year. Uh, close, at least. I guess it was uncontested, but that was impressive. Well, you and I couldn't do it uncontested. So, you know. Well, I mean, I've got my kids' little tykes hoop in the laundry room. You know, I could probably pull that off without jumping. But anyway, Um in all seriousness, it, it feels like Arkansas is starting to play a little better. I know that the the loss to Baylor in Waco was not what they wanted, not the outcome, but they played well, hung in there till the end. Uh, we, we talked about the defense being better. A&M is maybe the, the third best offensive team in the league, second or third probably. 
Um, to, to get 81 on AM and, and hold them to 70. That that is our Arkansas was in the tournament last night before the game was played, according to most people, and AM, I think, right there on the bubble. And I think obviously that that outcome won't change for either team. Yeah, I mean, it's just one more step to, you know, my should have should have wore a five and five shirt about two weeks ago because I'm like, <laughs> I, I, Arkansas is getting to five and five. Trust me. It's going to happen. So now they're a win at South Carolina away from that happening. And, yeah, you just kind of felt like even the Baylor loss, they're, they're playing better. You talk about, right, like schedules easing up a little bit. It's just starting to, you know, doesn't need to ease up necessarily with A&M, but it's at home. And I think that's the difference is like, you know, they went through that stretch where they're having to play at Auburn, Missouri, and so forth. And now it's just, you know, you get three straight SEC home games, you win all of them. As we always say, if you want to kind of be – where you need to be an SEC play, you just got to win your home games. And outside of the Alabama one, they've done that so far. And so, uh, yeah, this was, uh, I thought, a very impressive performance for Arkansas because this was one where we kind of joked that it's going to be the free throw shooting special. And you know, they only shot 52 free throws combined. That really doesn't feel like a lot. I mean, for other conferences, you may say, wow, but in the SEC, eh, give, give me 70 and then we'll talk. Um, but, you know, I just, I thought this was a game where, again, We've talked about the rotation. It's basically seven guys right now. Um, and I thought everybody gave them a little bit of something at the right time. And, and I thought that was something that was very important because, you know, we, we can say you, you can ride some of these guys. And I think, again, we kind of expect Council and Black. And I guess what, Davis played 37 minutes in this game. Those are the kind of the main guys that you're going to sort of ride is, is those 35 plus minute guys. I think the rest of the way, assuming, you know, the whole Nick Smith situation, everything. So I think that's, that's it. And, you know, this is the kind of game that shows if, if you get everybody on the same page and you can get a little production out of all, all of these guys, you know, Arkansas can beat anybody, especially Bud Walton. And, you know, I, I just thought they did a lot of things. I mean, the defense we've talked about, right? We, we've we said Arkansas has seemingly started to, and even the Baylor game, I thought they, they defended pretty well. Um, but during this stretch here where they've started to hit a little bit of a, an easier patch, they're, they're defending a lot better. And, you know, that's a, that's a big thing for a team that, as we said, I mean, it is what it is. I think, you know, they don't have the same offensive firepower they had in November. And so defense is going to be important for them, just as it is some of these other teams we talk about in the same context. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was, I was really impressed with Arkansas. I mean, they, you know, they turned the ball over, but you know what? That's A&M, right? Like mm -hmm. we've always said that like A&M just going to, the way they play, you're going to have some turnovers. And so to still win that game by 11, turn the ball over 17 times, um, you know, Arkansas's magic formula, I say all the time is getting to the free throw line, not settling for jump shots. And I thought they did a really good job of that in this game is just, being able to put themselves in a position where offensively they took advantage of the opportunities defensively. They made it really hard on an A&M team that you and I talked about, Chris, that's a, that's a really good scoring team. Like they've become that, but outside of their starting five, you know, no one scored zero bench points. So that was kind of an impressive thing too. And yeah, A&M just didn't hit enough shots, but I think you give some credit to Arkansas for that because, you know, A&M look at how many second chance opportunities A&M had. 24 offensive offensive rebounds and so still i think to be able to just to, to limit some of those opportunities and, and sure a&m missed some shots they you know maybe hit in other scenarios but i just thought this was a really impressive performance for arkansas because you know it seemed like there were some times where a&m was starting to maybe make a run or they try to make that run that would kind of get them over the the hump there but arkansas just had an answer and um yeah i, I was really impressed with the hogs in this one yeah, free throws was, was pretty even, but I think that the foul calls themselves probably impacted the game. You've got Anderson Garcia fouls out. Marble, Henry Coleman the third, and Wade Taylor the fourth all had four, so there was that. Uh, but um, speaking of bench points, and I cannot believe you and I were not texting back and forth during this one last night. How many bench points did Vandy get last night? Hold on, Chris. Before we get there, I'm going to say, oh. according to Ken Palm, the Arkansas Texas A&M game, length of the game was two hours and 16 minutes. Okay. Hmm. I thought it may be 245. So we, it's a victory there for everyone. <laughs> that That is true. <laughs> All right. Back to Vandy, Alabama. Uh, um, bench points. How many do you think they had? I mean, I know you know, but I, I don't. Um, <laughs> hmm. Some things weren't worth the effort. 
yeah it's <laughs> i don't even know where to start with this one I'll, I'll let you give your thought i don't know where to start yet so well let's see let's start here you're 20 how many something games during the season you're starting a walk on um <laughs> you're starting liam robbins on the bench again who did play I, hey let's you know let's Let's give a shout out to ourselves. Uh, we we warned you that um, Vandy has a habit of of keeping games close. Obviously, um, I'll take the the bag of shame for that one. We did, however, tell you that Liam Robbins uh, might be back better or sooner than people expected. Um, so so we nailed that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then he and Jordan Wright run into each other and just about concuss each other, and not that it mattered, but. That was um, not, not that you want anybody to get hurt or laugh at it, but that was sort of a visual of, of Vandy's night is is maybe their first and third best players running into each other. And yeah, I, <laughs> that was like, that was something else. I, I, I have not confirmed this. Someone said that was the third biggest blowout ever involving SEC teams. Um, Tyron Lawrence on the bench from start to finish. And Alabama, here, here's the stat that tells you, uh, I think, how much another team is, is really going after. Do you know what Alabama shot on twos? Um, It was pretty good. I know that. It was 17 of 20. That's 85%. 85%. Have you ever seen a team that shot 85% on two? No, look, it's it, it, well, it looked like me and the Little Tykes basketball goal on a lot of those. Uh, I saw it last night. Untested dunks. That's and, closer. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know, man. The, you said it's probably the, what was it the third, third biggest blowout? Is that what you said? Yeah, I think um, Vandy owns the first. That was the yes, year that, that Kevin been Stallings Kentucky. got beat. One hundred six forty four. I had to look this up. I it went to, to the sure Sweet Sixteen right. the next year. Yeah, yeah. I want to make sure I had it right. It was one hundred six forty four. That was in two thousand three. I thought it was two thousand four, but two thousand three. Um, I remember that game vividly. Um. I wonder what the other one is. That's a trivia note. If anyone remembers or knows, let us know. Uh, yeah, this was, what did I say? And I put this out on Twitter. I was like, you know, me. Um, let's see how Alabama responds after Oklahoma. That's going to tell us a lot, right? And then I put out the tweet where the, the guys just, you know, the flames are just kind of, it's exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, you know, you want if you want to see how, and that was my, my narrative the whole week was, Anybody who asked me, not just on our stuff, radio stuff, I'm like, yep. Yeah. I said, I, I'm, I'm not really looking a lot at this Alabama-Oklahoma game. I'm looking at the Vanderbilt game and the LSU game because that tells me way more about Alabama than that one game at Oklahoma. And, well, <laughs> as Nato said after what Nato said after the game, he just kind of apologized for Vanderbilt having to be the team that played them because they clearly came out and they did exactly what – I mean, it's perfection in terms of – if you wanted to see a team respond to their worst loss of the season, you could not have asked for a better scenario if you're Nate Oates for your team to just come out and do exactly what they just did. And yeah, I mean, it, it kind of is that way where you just Vanderbilt just happened to be the team in the way. And Alabama said, all right, we're going to come out and just kind of show you that we still are probably the most talented team in the country. I still believe that, you know, they got beat at Oklahoma. Um, and I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, this was one. This was a game where, when everything goes right for one team that is at the highest level in college basketball, which is Alabama, and everything sort of goes wrong for the the opposition um, that has really struggled to kind of find its way. This is what you get, and you know, it's a historical type game because we haven't seen a lot of these. And like you said, Vanderbilt unfortunately was on the the losing end of another one of those what twenty years ago now, but. Um, yeah, man, it was just uh, I don't know I don't know what else you say. I mean, 17 to 20 from two, 19 to 41 from three. There's no one. I mean, the Harlem Globetrotters aren't beating Alabama um, in that scenario. Like there, there's nobody that's sort of beating Alabama when they do those kind of things. And I mean, yeah, it's just Vanderbilt goes three of 30 from three. Once again, it's everything goes right for one way. It just goes the opposite the other way. And I mean. The, the, again, this is exactly what you want to see from Alabama, who played everyone. I think that I don't know. I think they played their entire bench. Um, but it's like for Vanderbilt, 
is it i don't think it's just hey we happen to be the team that alabama played no this is this is just that's on this is on a different level here and so that i think becomes the bigger question now i'm, I'm going to give our audience a test and if you know three or more of these names then you might be watching too much basketball Here's Vanderbilt's starting lineup last night. Miles Studi, Quentin Malore Brown, Emmanuel Ansong, Miles Keefe, and Paul Lewis. Um, Tyron Lawrence was a DNP who'd gotten 20 points. I, I thought Vanderbilt played well at Texas AM. I do not know what happened between Saturday and Tuesday night to to tick Jerry Stackhouse off, but something happened. Um yeah, I mean, look, we spent probably a little more time talking Vandy than we have Alabama, but I, I think when one SEC team beats another one by 57 points, it's more about what the, the team that scored 44 uh, di didn't do. V Vandy was 3 of 30. from th How many air balls did they throw up last night? Like, the, the number of air balls plus uncontested dunks had to be well into double figures. Maybe another SEC record there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, again, I don't, there's probably not a lot to say about Alabama because it's like, I mean, it's look, it, it's one, it's the most dominant performance we've seen this year from anybody, I guess, in that regard. But I mean, they, yeah, for me, like, that's all I needed. Like, I apologize, Alabama, for moving you to number two in yeah. the power rankings. So it's my apologies. Like, I should have left you at number one, like Chris did. Um, Sorry, Tennessee. Like, uh, I'd like to retroactively put Alabama back at one uh, after that performance. So maybe that's what happened. I, I can't say it didn't happen. I think I it is. It I, I think can't it say is. that Nate Oates did not go on YouTube one day on Monday and say, well, there's an SEC power, basketball power rankings for January 30th. And there's Chris Lee, Blake Lovell. And these guys have decided Tennessee should be number one. Well, let me just hang this up in the locker room. Let's put this on loop. I can't confirm or deny that. But my guess is it probably wasn't that. Um, my guess is though he 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 lit a fire in them after that Oklahoma game, and again, that's exactly how you want to see a team respond. Yeah. But for the Vanderbilt side, again, I mean, look, I, I don't want to go too far, but like this was a Vanderbilt team, as we said, it pretty much kept everything close. They had just almost had a chance to win at A and M, so it's one game, and maybe it's just the Al and you know somebody going from extremes. Like to go from playing in Alabama and they're going to play Ole Miss at home on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Once again, I think that's where you, you know, do they bounce back or was this kind of the, the straw, right? That just breaks and, or maybe it broke before this game based on the lineup situation. I don't know. So we'll see. Well, I will tell you this, boring a miracle that I don't see coming, uh, you can't sell Jerry Stackhouse to his own fan base anymore. I, I think that is about as unanimous as I've seen Vanderbilt fans in wanting a coaching change. If you search Twitter last night, it was brutal. <laughs> Which yeah. I guess that's not that's not out of the ordinary. A, you, you, but... can, you can say that about anything, but <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, that's the kind of loss. Like I said, it's who it's just yeah, that's a that's a bad bad loss in the context of where the program. Because well, that's the thing, right? We kept saying, like, they're just kind of hanging around and they're not, they're not bottoming out yet. You know, all these games, you know, most of them have been closed, not every single one of them, but, but then you have that happen. And it's just, oh, it's all of a sudden unleashes all of that, <laughs> that unhappiness that, that has been there for a while, but yet was able to kind of calm a little bit after the win at Georgia, I think, because they were three and three in the league. But now it's like, eh, he didn't play great against Kentucky. Eh, played well against A&M, had their chances on the road. But now you come back and just get destroyed by Alabama. And, yeah, it's just a, a bad combination of things. Uh, and I I don't know. It's um, not great. Kentucky, you're next. The Wildcats go to Ole Miss when that won 75-66. You were right. You, your gut was that would be a close game. It was a close game. Um, Matt Morell did not play. So kudos to Ole Miss for keeping it close without that. But uh, you know, play, who knew to play last night was Savio Wheeler. Had one of 
his best games in in a while. Had to without Casey Wallace. Had to. Um, I mean, that's the thing is, you know, this was not easy for a while for Kentucky. Like, it really wasn't. And what is it? It was tied at half, I think. And, you know, eventually Kentucky made a run and was able to kind of pull away. I don't remember exactly when the point was that happened in the second half. But, I mean, this was this was kind of like I'm thinking, oh, man, like they cannot lose this game. But I also thought I thought that once, but then I just kind of felt, you know, I don't really know why I should think Ole Miss is going to find a way to win this game because they don't have morale, as we said, Deshaun Ruffin. They don't, I just don't, you know, those are two guys we banked on coming to the season being their top two guys and neither on the floor. And so you just felt like as long as Kentucky can kind of just make one of those runs, it's going to be hard for Ole Miss to come back against that. And that's what happened. Uh, and, you know, that was just kind of how the game played out. But yes, I mean, Severe Wheeler had to because Case and Wallace, I know they said they held him out for, I don't know, his precautionary reasons. Um, back again. No, it was the – it was something that happened in the – who did they play before this? I, it all runs together to me. Um, something happened in the game before, Kansas, the Kansas game. Yeah. Uh, it Something with his um, – my gosh, you put me on the spot here. I think it's his knee. Yeah, it was his knee. So, I think it's precautionary holding him out. So, I mean, obviously that's significant in terms of moving forward, right? Um, you know, that, that – can't be anything too significant, but they're using the precautionary wording. So you would assume everything's okay there and he'll be back soon enough. But yeah, I mean, once again, though, right, it, it kind of changes your rotation. And it, I was curious to see what they look like in this setting without, you know, the guy that's become their primary, you know, ball handler and leader on offense. And well, it just happened to be Antonio Reeves who does his thing, uh, comes out and scores 27 and, I mean, he's now scored double figures, I think, in eight straight games, I believe it is. Hit the 20-point mark, I think, three times in that stretch now. And, yeah, I mean, he's just – that – look, we always say this, right? And, and we say, well, in the context of the SEC especially, if you can make threes, if you just have – I mean, really, go think about this. Like, he goes 6-7, right, in this game. And then you go back to the game against Kansas. And you're just like, man, <laughs> it's like, we just hit – we just hit two or three more threes, right? We had said to go in two of 13 and lose by nine to Kansas. Like it's just a completely different game. And, and that's, that's the thing with Kentucky is like, if, if these guys are hitting shots from outside, I mean, specifically him, cause he's the only one that hit one uh, in this game. It just, it changes how they can do their offense so much because you have Sheboy in there to do his thing. You know, he's going to get some offensive rebounds. He's going to get some second chance opportunities. Um, and so, just makes the game so much easier. And that's why you and I are always bringing this up and it probably sounds like a broken record at times, but it is, it's like, you know, I, if more sec teams, you know, just had those guys like this and, and it's not all the time, but can just consistently knock down, you know, Auburn would love to have a guy right now that could make four threes a game mm -hmm. or three threes a game um, consistently, Arkansas, probably the same way. And so, you know, it's just, it, it changes how you can, it changes how you're guarded. <laughs> I mean, it's just Reeves has a game like this where he's just making everything. And that's a dynamic Kentucky does still have at its disposal. Um, so, you know, I just think that it makes it so much easier and he's not gonna go six, seven every game, but that opened things up a bit for Kentucky here offensively. And Jacob Toppin, again, I mean, you got to keep pointing him out. I think someone else that's really just continued to play well. And I mean, he just, he's given them a lot and, I've just been really impressed kind of with his consistency now. And um, so, yeah, uh, again, it's a nice win for Kentucky, as we kind of said about Mississippi State, because you can't afford to lose this one, especially for a Kentucky team that's been right there on the the edge of the tournament. Um, so, yeah, nice win for Kentucky, but Reeves was a story. And, again, hopefully the bigger story isn't, you know, anything significant with Case and Wallace, because they certainly need him back, I think, to to be a team that can make a run in the tournament. So. Parting thoughts on SEC hoops from January 31st. Well, I apologize for any video issues. We got this ice, ice storm going on around here, Chris, as you know, and yeah. I've been seeing my signal go in and out a little bit. So if it kind of has stuttered a little bit on anyone's side, I apologize for that. But um, listen, I don't control the weather. I just control the Southeastern 14 YouTube channel here where you find all sorts of great stuff. You liked that, didn't you? Like that segue. I thought you were um, going to say you control the information. I control the information on the Southeastern 14 YouTube channel as well. 
And uh, yeah, we got a lot of great stuff. Um, be sure to check everything out. We've got football, basketball, baseball. We did our interview yesterday for Kentucky fans with uh, Nick Menji on there. And you can check out um, that interview, which was uh, a lot of fun. So you can see what Kentucky baseball is going to have coming to the season. We'll have more interviews on the way. We're working on a couple of those right now. Um, so that'll be part of our, our baseball season preview. And um, yeah, a lot of great stuff. So hit that subscribe button. He is Blake Lovell. I'm Chris Lee. We're Southeastern 14. We'll see you again soon.